Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the first panel session for today is on township, tax and trade, the future of cities as investment hubs, moderated by Mr. Dylan Tan, partner in charge, Johor KPMG Malaysia. Dylan has extensive audit work experience in a wide range of industry. His key clientele includes multinational corporations and public listed companies which are involved in trading and manufacturing businesses relating to electrical and electronics industry and companies that are involved in logistics, plantations and public development. Over to you, Dylan. Hi, thank you, Mel, for a wonderful uh, introduction. Hi, good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depends on the location that you're down in. Um, is with is with great privilege that uh, I'm able to be the moderator for today's event uh, with the title of the future of cities as investment hub. Together with me here, we have got three panelists. Um, I would like to introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, the first one is uh, Madam Rosalina Ramlan. She's a director of MIDA. Uh, which stand for Malaysia Investment Development Authority. MIDA is the, the, the uh, authority that is tasked with bringing in investment into Malaysia. So for all foreign investors who want to come and set up businesses in Malaysia, MIDA will be the, the party that you speak to. The second panel uh, panelist will be Mr. Raymond Siva. Mr. Raymond is the Chief Marketing Officer of MDEC. MDEC stands for Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation. MDEC is actually the organization that is tasked with organizing and leading the Malaysia digital economy. So MDEC is the hot authority that many people want to speak to now because of the pandemic. A lot of people are now uh, talking about digitalization. So, so Raymond has got a very uh, huge hat to wear. Now, let me introduce the third speaker. Um, is Mr. Hasmi Yusuf. He's the Managing Director of Frost & Sullivan Malaysia. I think Frost & Sullivan need not further in, uh, introduction. It's actually one of the global leading research and consulting firm. Okay, without further ado, let me go into uh, a brief introduction of what we're gonna talk about. So in 2020 and 2021, we actually seen a vast number of businesses, they closed their premises, and there's a huge number of uh, employees that were either laid off or are now working from home. Because of this, the government have actually introduced a lot of unprecedented economic responses in order to help out the businesses as well as all these employees to deal with the pandemic impact. As welcome as the support is, it's not expected that uh, the support will last forever. So COVID-19 has actually changed the business landscape for everybody. While some of the changes are expected to be temporary, there are others who are expected to last much longer into the future. For example, working from home. We can be sure that the future will remain fluid for quite some time as the business environment continue to change alongside with the progress of each country in combating the viruses. Now, um, it's time for me to now direct my question to our first pan panelist, um, Mr. Hasmi uh, from Frost and Sullivan. So the impact of coronavirus is actually being felt by businesses all around the world. And the leaders are navigating a broad range of interrelated issues, include keeping their employees and their customers safe, Incre increase their cash and liquidity, as well as reorienting the operation and dealing with, at the same time, dealing with the complicated government support programs. So with that as, as a backdrop, um, I would like you to ask you this question, taking into consideration the experience of the pandemic crisis, from the investor point of view, on the long list of what we call typical city characteristics, which would you, which one would you think would be the most attractive characteristic that investor would consider in deciding a good location to invest in? 
Uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Hasmi. Thank you very much, Dylan. Uh, very good morning. Assalamualaikum, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, again, very excited to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I think um, one of the, um, um, you know, trend that we see, um, not just in Frost and Sullivan, but I think with our clients um, as well, and I think all over the world is that, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and probably endemic now, really emphasize, I think, the importance of urban city living. Um, you know, you, as you can, you, as you know, um, you know, city makes up of you know, two things. One is physical proximity, and the other is demographic concentration. So I think through this pandemic, people through experiential learning, people are now have been reminded of, you know, the, I would say the value of connectedness of a city and this overall holistic offering it provides. Give you, you know, simple example is people realize that during lockdown, during pandemic, if you want to get a, a loaf of gardenia bread, chances are you're, you're better off get, finding one in the city than let's say in, in the kampong, for example. You know, so access to uh, medical services, and, and, and a, a, a long range of other services, you know, it's easier to get in the cities. So I think this is something that um, has been kind of uh, underlined by the, 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 the pandemic. And you see that, you know, today, you know, if you drive to uh, KLCC, say Friday evening, you know, it's a chocolate block traffic today, for example. So city, it's, it's, uh, it's more important than ever in my in my first uh, context of this. Second, I think um, cities today, and um, not to mention even Iskandar, but I think uh, cities are kind of like renewing, revisiting how it creates value, uh, you know, for its residents, for its businesses, and basically community all around. So I think a uh, good example is Iskandar's next um, program. Um, it's really to you know, look at the, the the value creation again, because I think this is something which is fluid and has to kind of change and adapt with the times, right? So today, if you look at one of the Iskandar Next program, uh, it has a, a, you know, a strong product or emphasis on risking uh, upskilling kind of thing. So if I were to um, circle back to your question, I mean, I will answer with, um, you know, what makes a city or a local a place, the right location, rather than the, a good location to invest. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, I, I put myself 15 years ago, uh, the metrics that you know, investors of Sensalvan back then put together uh, to see whether uh, this location is feasible or not, or that location and so on. The list now, my God, is has gotten longer, right? Um, today, I think, you know, if you look at the, the metrics that that's, that, that uh, investor look, looks at, you know, it's now we are, you know, it's, it's, it goes beyond just legal statutory frameworks, government policies, you know, tax incentives. Those are basically, you know, those are baseline metrics. Um, I think today you look at um, um, a whole new, you know, range of metrics from carbon footprint, I think ESG in its, in its, uh, in, in, in a broader context will be key. Uh, companies today looks at, and, and, uh, and this is quite, quite compelling, a work-life balance, mental health metrics. You know, they look at, you know, for example, wellness, happiness index, and so on. So today it, it, it is, you know, it, it, it is a long range of metrics that, you know, we, we all look at uh, identifying the right place. So uh, in, in a way to surmise in, uh, in a word, you know, I would say that, you know, investor looks at um, vibrancy, vibrancy of the location. So vibrancy basically makes up of all these metrics, as we mentioned, um, uh, in a city or a location. And, um, uh, but, you know, if, if I were to give a single answer or one word um, um, beyond a vibrancy, I would probably think that the, 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 the most important metrics is market access. Um, it, it, is, it is a bit of a paradox for investors and authorities alike, this, this market access, because on one hand, I think as a result of um, um, 
uh, you know, the, the reaction to decades of globalization, you know, countries, not just in Malaysia, talking about um, America, make America great again, India focusing on their making India, you know, um, countries are more once, you know, there's, there's higher growing sentiment of nationalism, uh, localization, um, and, um, you know, um, you know, for example, I would say, you know, Brexit is another example of, of this trend. And yet, on the other hand, um, you have government wanting companies to, to invest in their respective hubs and, and all provide kind of a, their own proposition of market access. So it's kind of like a juxtapose or paradox between, but, the, but I think uh, if you look at the, a bigger picture, how businesses, industry, supply chain has become fairly decentralized, you know, I think market access is super important for, for any um, companies um, you know, when they, they look at investing in a certain location. What can this location provide me with, you know, market access? What kind of market access? And I think this is something um, um, I would say a lot of um, um, authorities, um, you know, not, not, I mean, I'm talking about globally in general, are not paying that close attention. Um, so if you look at uh, cities like, um, you know, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore and all that, they, they provide their own unique market access um, and I think you know, there you it's it's hard not to you know invest in those kind of locations for example um, so yeah so in, in my kind of like short um, summary I would say vibrancy and market access yeah. thank you thank you Mr. Hasmi I, I totally agree with you I think vibrancy of a city is really something that uh, you know when you are in a city that's very vibrant it just make your heart beat faster so, so when, when the, the so-called state border opens up, I had the opportunity to, to you know, visit KL for a couple of days. You know, I, I agree with you, you know, people are out there. It's almost like life is already more or less back to normal. And, and uh, Johor, Johor Bahru being a smaller city, so we, 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 we always have this, uh, so ex we always get excited when we have a chance to travel to KL because you, you, you feel a totally different vibrancy. And... Um, of course, uh, I was also very excited. I myself live in uh, Iskanda, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, to me, this area, I'm always very excited to see a lot of new development. You know, uh, those that are, um, although the pandemic kind of slowed things down a little bit, but, but overall, I'm, I'm just happy with the, with the master plan uh, of what's going on in Iskanda, Malaysia. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hasmi. So I'd like to now maybe turn to our second panelist, um, Madam uh, Rosalina. Okay, I, okay, the question I have is that uh, maybe we start with the background, yeah? So Malaysia economy is expected to rebound in 2022 in line with the expected recovery in the global economy throughout the second half of 2021 and expected to continue into the next year. So this is happening because a lot of countries are stepping up their vaccination efforts. So as soon as uh, more vaccination is done in the country, and once those countries have decided to live together with the virus rather than to have a policy of exterminating the virus to zero, then you will see that things are going back to normal. So with that, uh, my first question is, how is Malaysia coping with COVID-19 and the mitigating measures? In particular, MIDA's role in sustained quality investment post-COVID-19. Over to you, uh, Madam. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to everyone. Okay, to answer, uh, you know, uh, the question, I would say that, uh, you know, the surge of uh, COVID-19 cases and uh, economic global uncertainty have definitely impacted, uh, you know, Malaysia's growth towards a projected GDP of uh, 6% to 7.5% this year. So going uh, forward, uh, Malaysia must adopt a comprehensive uh, approach to revitalize the investment ecosystem, as well as to respond to emerging mega trends and the evolving needs of uh, our investors. While uh, Malaysia's investment strategies were always underpinned by the Malaysia plans and industrial master plans, 
there is a need to pursue cohesive investment policies as well as to streamline mandates of all investment promotion agencies. The goal is simple. First is to attract quality and strategic investment. Second is to reduce dependency on unskilled labor and third, to spur technology transfer. The government has uh, formulated a forward-looking growth framework uh, the National Investment Aspiration, or in short, uh, NIA, that will form the basis for comprehensive reform of Malaysia's investment policies. The uh, framework is guided by the first pillar. The first one is to increase economic diversity and complexity through the development of sophisticated products and services with local, uh, high local uh, R&D and innovation. Second is to create high value jobs. Third is to expand and integrate domestic linkages into regional and global supply chain. Fourth, to develop new and existing clusters, focusing on high productivity sectors, including local products and services. And the fifth one is to improve inclusivity to contribute towards the social economic developmental agenda. So these uh, five pillars, these goals, together with the fundamentals of environmental, social and governance, ESG, are embedded into the key national plans such as Economic Recovery Plan, 12th Nature Plan, and also the new Industrial Master Plan. Uh, the NIA is uh, expected to propel long-term growth for Malaysia through the flow of sustainable quality investment in new and complex growth areas. Given uh, is the case of investment promotion and facilitation track record, MAIDA will be assuming a more prominent role in this initiative as part of institutional reform and also in line with the NIA mandate for better policy coherence. So as the coordinating central investment promotion agency and a one-stop center for potential investment, MAIDA looks forward to working collaboratively with all investment promotion agencies to harness the competitive strengths of each and every state within Malaysia. So through these collective efforts, Malaysia is uh, poised to increase its competitiveness, gaining investors' confidence, and ultimately becoming the epicenter for economic and business activities in the region. Uh, to ensure Malaysia remains as the preferred investment destination and trading partner of choice, uh, this year alone, uh, MAIDA has uh, carried out a total of four trade and investment mission to Japan, uh, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, and uh, the recent one was to Germany, France, and UK, which was led by uh, Yang Berhormat uh, Datuk Sri uh, Az Muhammad Azmin Ali, Senior Minister and Minister of International Trade and Industry. Uh, this uh, trade investment mission was uh, held from uh, January to October uh, this year. And the total investment commitment for all these uh, trade and investment mission is 50.07 billion and has the potential to create 30,083 jobs for Malaysians. So next year alone, uh, MAIDA is also planning uh, 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 12 more uh, trade and investment missions, as well as uh, specific project missions and uh, strike force program to ensure that uh, Malaysia continue to be the uh, preferred investment destination hub in Asia. So I'll pause there, Dylan. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Madam uh, Rosalina. Okay, uh, I, I think I, 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 I generally, I believe that the country is moving in the right direction. I think to reduce the, our dependency on skilled labor, uh, as well as uh, increasing the, the, the automation, you know, as, as, in, as part right. of the business, it's no longer about, I think in the past, we always look at cost and benefit analysis. Yeah? Like for example, uh, you know, uh, whether it costs more, you know, to, to incorporate automation, right? Because unskilled labor are relatively cheaper in Malaysia. But, but right now with the COVID pandemic, it has to be done more as a matter of uh, reducing the exposure risk to the virus, as well as it's, it's practically have to do with survival, right? So, so from, from, from that, 
perspective, I, I really feel that uh, the country have put in place a, a correct strategy. Now I'll move on to the second question. Um, you, you might answer part of it, but, but feel free to extend even more. What are the steps taken by MIDA to support foreign investors to ensure business continuity and to position Malaysia as one of the best countries to invest? Over to you, Adam. All right, thank you. Uh, MIDA has been working on a lot of initiatives. So uh, this year, last year was a very busy year for us. So among the initiatives that uh, we have been undertaking, uh, first one is the at, uh, establishment of DIO. So uh, DIO is a digital investment office, whereby uh, this office was endorsed by the National Council of uh, Digital Economy and Fourth Industrial Revolution, or in short, MED4IR Council, which was checked by our former prime minister uh, way back in April uh, earlier this year. So uh, this uh, DIO is a fully digital collaborative platform between MAIDA and also MDEC to coordinate and facilitate all digital uh, investments. So this initiative is a, uh, we call it a one nation uh, approach where DIO will work closely with all IPAs and corridors authority to attract uh, 70 billion investment in digitalization by year 2025. So this 70 billion investment is in line with uh, uh, my digital blueprint uh, aspiration uh, uh, to attract uh, investment into the country. Uh, DIO also provides end-to-end uh, -end facilitation to investors uh, covering from pre and post uh, project implementation. This includes uh, providing information on the opportunities of digital investment, and the implementation of the project. The IO will also assist uh, to identify the relevant stakeholders to assist in facilitating the project by uh, leveraging on existing resources committee or task force. The, uh, our office is also reachable uh, via Malaysia Heart of Digital ASEAN or MyHoda portal, which can be accessed through www.heartofdigitalasean.my as well as uh, MIDA's official website. Through MyHoda um, portal, investors will be able to submit uh, digital investment interest via a single entry point uh, create, uh, to create a quick facilitation for quality digital investment into the country. Um, second one, as part of the Malaysia's new economic recovery plan, or in short, Penjana, uh, MAIDA has also been mandated to establish the Project Acceleration and Coordination Unit, or in short, Part 2, uh, with the aim to accelerate the implementation of approved projects. So these, uh, these projects are approved in the National uh, Committee uh, of Investment, uh, and um, the project is being monitored through digitalized system which will uh, provide real-time uh, tracking. So through this PACHU at MAIDA, end-to-end uh, -end facilitation for all projects is offered to enable uh, timely implementation of investment in the country. The initiative that uh, you know, MAIDA uh, undertook was to launch an online submission and processing platform, uh, which is named Invest Malaysia where uh, it acts as a single processing window for all approvals uh, for manufacturing licenses, incentives, and exemption of custom duties. Uh, this is to expedite the execution of project. Uh, fourth one, uh, we have a lot of initiatives, so you know, I'll just uh, you know, summarize it uh, very uh, general. Uh, we also established One Stop Center which was uh, set up on uh, 2nd October 2020, which was aimed to ease the movement of business travelers that stay in the country for 14 days or less by expediting their approval to enter Malaysia. So this one-stop center uh, is uh, represented by the Ministry of International Trade and Industry Omiti, uh, MAIDA, Ministry of Health and also Immigration Department of Malaysia. So once uh, you know uh, the um, uh, investors has been given the uh, approval to enter Malaysia through OSC, 
then they can utilize the Business Traveler Center or uh, in short, BTC. So BTC is located at Terminal 3, uh, Gate C36 in KLIA. Uh, and uh, its uh, establishment is to ease the entry movement of business travelers by providing facilities to expedite uh, investors' entry process as well as to provide relevant information and guidelines. There will be duty officers at BTC that will be assisting these business travelers to screen and, uh, and verify their documents for faster facilitation at immigration counter. And at BTC also, uh, you know, business uh, travelers um, will take their uh, RT-PCR COVID test before they uh, go out from the uh, KLIA. To further uh, support, uh, you know, countries' uh, ecosystem development, uh, MAIDA Assessment Development Center, or in short, MADC, has also been established. So uh, this initiative uh, is uh, based on a trilateral cooperation between MAIDA, uh, universities, and also companies, which aim to develop young leaders for future hybrid talent, which has a combination of technical and soft skill, uh, display flexibility and adaptability to start at lower skill, and then progress quickly with the right leadership as required by the industry. So MADC will uh, provide opportunities to pull strength and tap into a wealth of industry expertise towards equipping the university and also TVET graduates with relevant skills and future needs of the Industry 4.0 especially in the field of uh, IoT, Internet of Things, uh, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, big data, as well as uh, cybersecurity. So given the uh, current pandemic impact on uh, health, safety, work and business, uh, Malaysian government is also intensifying digitalization uh, within all levels of the economy and delivery services to increase the ease of doing business for investors in Malaysia. So I'll stop there, Dylan. Thank you. Hey, th thank you, Madam. Thank you. I'm very glad to hear that there are so many initiatives uh, that MIDA is uh, undertaking. And um, you, you also mentioned that uh, the Digital Investment Office, you know, is working very, very closely closely with MDEC, yeah? So, which is, you know, when I now need to turn to the next speaker um, from MDEC, uh, Mr. Raymond. Okay. The, the background is the emphasis on digital and technology for the nation's development in the 12th Malaysia plan was announced by our Prime Minister, Dato Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob, in the five-year Malaysia plan with the theme, a prosperous, inclusive, and sustainable Malaysia. This is aimed to steer Malaysia out of COVID-19 pandemic effect and put the economy back on track. Okay, with that, uh, I'd like to ask my first question now. So what are the initiatives taken by MTech to attract investment and advance Malaysia digital economy. Anything in terms of infrastructure that are being rolled out to support the growth of the digital economy? Over to you, Mr. Raymond. Uh, good morning, selamat pagi. Uh, salam for all the Malaysia. Uh, thank you very much, Dylan, my fellow panelists. Uh, mindful of time, um, just dive straight into it, yeah? So a bit, bit of a background, uh, and you guys know uh, MDEC for, for what we are right now, but if you think back, we are celebrating the 25th anniversary yeah, of our setup, so it's a silver jubilee. We set up in 1996, really, as the agency to implement the uh, ICT initiative, which was called the Multimedia Super Corridor. Yeah? So Multimedia Development Corporation, uh, which was the precursor to MDEC, was set up then, uh, 25 years ago again, to advance the nation's uh, uh, journey yeah, towards a more advanced uh, uh, economy. Uh, so from a zero contribution to the GDP back then, we're up to now 22.5%, which is really comparable, if not more, than the contribution of the oil and gas sector yeah, to, to the economy. So that's pretty large and, and it's growing, right? And the targets under the My Digital Blueprint says we've got to get into 25.5% of GDP by 2025, yeah? So um, it's, a, it's an ambitious uh, target. I think one that can be achieved based on the bigger growth of the digital economy and the uh, across the region and also in Malaysia, right? Uh, as we come out of the of the three R's that you just mentioned, right? So right now we're looking at the recovery, uh, you know, business and reform. I think it's 
people to understand the role of digital yeah, in, in the economy. And um, MDEC, if we can call ourselves the original startup, where the word wasn't even coined 25 years ago, we have that DNA with us, right, in terms of, uh, you know, trying to build that ecosystem together. Yeah? Uh, and so, uh, if you talk about infrastructure, what we started out was the corridor, multimedia super corridor, which was from KLCC, if you remember, right up to Cyber Jaya, right? It was a, it was a physical corridor, 60 by 40. Right? And, and so, that, that, that's how it was envisaged to be with TPM in the middle, right? Technology Park Malaysia in the middle. And I think to some extent we've succeeded uh, in, in turning around that corridor into a space where a lot of innovation has happened, yeah? And we've also managed to get investments. But more importantly, over the last 25 years as well, we've moved up. Yeah? So we have got 72 cyber cities and cyber centers, right? status given to property owners um, as well as uh, other operators to what I would say, bring the benefits of digital, yeah, uh, or at least the benefit of MSC across Malaysia, right? So there's 72 locations. Uh, but what has happened over the last two years is remote working, work from home, and all of this has really disrupted the way uh, investments are done and, and how investments are run, yeah, more importantly. Yeah? So we don't see a need uh, to, to be physically based at a particular location for you to do digital business, it just doesn't make sense, right? Uh, anymore. So the pandemic has really said, listen, uh, the way we do business has to change. There's just no choice, right? The way we hire talents and, and, and help our investors land has to change. Uh, so we would, we would be looking at a refresh uh, of the MSC, right? Uh, it's about time, it's 25 years, right? So the key uh, component of the MSC is the Bill of Guarantees. Yeah? So we have 10 uh, Bill of Guarantees. Uh, some of that are manifestly uh, not quite relevant at this point of time. Yeah, so we need to relook and see what is the relevance of the bill of guarantees uh, to the companies that we're building or bringing it to the SC status. Yeah, right. Uh, and because our remit now has expanded, not to just MSC ICT, but to the Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, MSC is only a subset of our mandate to assist in the growth or spur the growth of the digital economy, right? We feel that now with the liberalization of the location requirement, upliftment or an expansion of the location requirement, any companies can go anywhere in Malaysia and uh, if they fulfill the conditions uh, uh, required, as new conditions, then they're able to enjoy the MSC status, yeah? which then allows them fiscal and non-fiscal benefits, right? So not all companies these days are looking for tax. You know, uh, there, there are other considerations, foreign knowledge, ecosystem, uh, market access, and all of that, right? Uh, so the, the non-fiscal and fiscal status under the, the new MSC 2.0, I think it's going to be a significant change, what we say infrastructure, right? So not we are not reliant on the physical infrastructure, but we are now reliant more on your talent mobility, we're, we're reliant more on the market access and, and democratization of digital opportunities throughout Malaysia. How do we do that? We must work with our friends and colleagues at MIDA, right? And our industry colleagues and our current investors and the chambers of commerce and so on. And really what uh, Juan Ro said earlier on, the DIO, uh, I think it's a game changer, right? We at MDEC think it's a game changer, right? Uh, we acknowledge and we fully support MIDA as the main uh, key agency for all investments. Uh, but we also would like to play of supporting that mandate that MIDA has for digital investments, right? Uh, so both of us, I think, with MIDA's long, strong track record, uh, and us, you know, the startups as you made five years ago and understanding that, I think we're able to come together to really bring that as a single window, yeah? Uh, and for me, that infrastructure uh, is going to be critical in terms of how we move things forward, okay? Uh, so right now, uh, the MSC has about 2,794 active companies uh, cut across GBS, cut across uh, uh, IP uh, services. Uh, we also have uh, digital created content, yeah? 300 or so uh, anime, uh, what do you call that, a VR animation and, and created content companies, uh, then as well as the infra companies as well. So it's quite a robust ecosystem yeah? that we can. Uh, recently, we launched something called the MSC Investors Exchange, 
it's more of a KYC. We want to know our customers. Uh, so we've touched about 550 companies in a span of like seven uh, months and fantastic feedback, right? Uh, we've got new funnel, new leads, we've got the concerns and so on and so forth. Now, just on that, uh, you know, because we're here among friends, um, some of the concerns that get out there and I want to address them just up front is the clarity and consistency of our policies, our digital investment policies, right? The clarity and the consistency of the application of our policies, right? I think it's important for any investors to understand where we're going for, right? Number two, the concern is around talent, yeah? Um, so, you know, our talent study that we've done and also I think by LinkedIn recently shows there are 50,000 open jobs in the digital sector over the last five months. 50,000 uh, open jobs, okay? There's not been filled yet, right? But on the other hand, we're hearing the graduates and the guys saying, Alamak, there's no jobs. You know, we're, we're struggling. There's there's a problem of unemployment and underemployment, right? So something is not here, right? Uh, and, and we really have to think about how do we do the matching, right? There's digital talents that are coming up and there's digital demand, which is growing by the day, which then leads to another issue about can I bring in foreign knowledge workers, right? So the second question around talent is really important yeah? about how we now do that mapping and matching so we get the talents in there. And maybe one of the solutions could be micro credentialing, right, of courses. Because if you think about it, yeah? if you do a four-year course or a two-year diploma, by the time you do a four-year course and graduate two years from now, blockchain, as you know it, would have changed tremendously, right? So you're not ready for technology in the market when you graduate at the current way the system is run. Right? So the, I think the education funneling, uh, that infrastructure needs to also be looked at very, very seriously. So we're able to uh, be very agile in the way we match our digital talents to the investor interest that is obviously in there. I think Juan Rose will agree and, and you know, Juan Hasmi will, uh, Jasmine will agree that there is investor interest in Malaysia. We have seen the funnel coming in. Right? How do we expand on that? So clarity and consistency of policies, talent. And the third one, also very critical, is tax and incentives. Right, like what, what is the fiscal uh, uh, frameworks uh, that we have in place? Right, and there's a lot of work being done uh, on, on MOF, on DIO, on MIDA, and also on MDEC as we revise our DOG and our incentives. I think that's critical, yeah, for us to look at not just tax incentives but other like minded incentives, right? Like the, the ITA, uh, the investment tech allowance, or the FB, you know, services allowance, and all of this uh, really needs to be packaged. I think budget has been given. And recently, uh, you know, Maida has got it in the budget as well, the digital accelerator. Uh, uh, I know, uh, Juan Rose, I think you'll talk about it a bit later. I think a very, very important uh, uh, policy moves, right, or at least short term uh, covering for us to get the investor interest in here. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I, I will now move on to my second question. Okay, Malaysia has been known for GBS location after India and Philippines. So in recent years, we also see new locations such as Estonia, Vietnam, and Batam surface as new locations for GPS. So what is the roadmap to sustain Malaysia as the preferred location? Over to you. So when you say Philippines and India, I would like to say that we started first. You know, 10 years ago, we were known, right? As I said, so with all the biggest companies here in South Jaya. So again, we have that, that uh, you know, the DNA and the knowledge of right? So in GBS, if you think about it, we're looking at the digital global business services, right? So it's not GBS as it was two or three years ago. Then you're competing against, like you rightly pointed out, India and the Philippines, right? The pandemic has shown very clearly uh, in the Philippines is that, uh, and I don't mean this in a bad way, this is what I'm hearing from our GBS industry, that the connectivity is a problem, right? When you say work from home or work remote, they don't have the stability or the ubiquity of the internet connectivity, right? India is getting expensive, there's no more cost arbitrage, right? So even if you're working there, you're, 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 even if you see labor is on par with Malaysia, the rentals and the cost of doing business is high rocketing. It's not cheap. Real estate is really expensive in the key area, right? And other areas, again, internet connectivity. So we then emerge quite naturally yeah, with the digital global business services as a GBS hub. We think about standard hearted, 5,000 bum on seats, you know, take out 5,200, right? This is their largest delivery center, the global delivery center here, right? We've got all the business units here for GBS. That's just one example, right? We've got others, you know, all across like, like tele-performance in, in uh, Penang, we do that, right? 
which are doing trust and safety for certain clients, right? And they're growing at a bigger of headcount, huh? 25, 30%, if not more, right? Over the last like six months, if you look at every quarter, they're growing, growing, growing already. So huge amount of, of opportunities, diversity of our language, our skill set, our English is good, our Mandarin is solid, you know, we've got Mahasa Malaysia, Mahasa Indonesia, you know, and then, you know, we can grab in, you know, any other things. So I think language is not a problem, skill set is perhaps something that's being addressed, like, like I said earlier, right? Skill set, we need to relook it. So if you look at it, uh, in the MSC at least, yeah, the numbers that we have, 53% of investments in the MSC come from the GBS, 53%, huh? right? Uh, it also contributes 57% of our exports from the MSC and 62% of the jobs created in the MSC. That is how important the TV sector is, right? So when people say it's a sunset industry, I disagree. And it's a key component of our digital investment future five, the HIF five strategy that we talk about here. 50 billion in investments, 50,000 high value jobs, five unicorns, five sectors, five tech, right? And GBS. Right? And you should talk about robotic process analytics, you talk about you know, data analytics and all that. DGBS, I think, would be a very important way that we move forward and also a very good way to get on the ground level uh, our graduates and those who are unemployed. Right? I mean, that many people in, and then you push them up, right? Uh, to the top. So it's a very easy way to get them into, into, into the diploma. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Raymond. Uh, th thanks for uh, the answer to the second question. I, I will now, uh, due to time limit, I will now just want to maybe talk very quickly on uh, tax uh, incentive. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I think as part of this, to deal with the pandemic, to help to, to kickstart the economy, uh, to grow back to the uh, good old day again. So I think uh, there were also new tax incentive uh, that, that are being rolled out by the government. So I would like to direct this question to uh, Juan Rose. Yeah, to attract foreign companies to relocate their businesses to Malaysia. So what is the tax incentive that were announced under the Panchana that was mentioned by you earlier? Uh, Juan Rose, over to you. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, I'll make it very quick because I'm very mindful of the time. So under the Panjana, uh, two uh, incentive and grants was, uh, uh, were introduced. One is special uh, tax incentive under Penjana, which was uh, announced on uh, 5th June 2020. But that one was uh, catered for manufacturing companies that wish to relocate their manufacturing businesses into Malaysia. So uh, under budget 2021, it has been expanded to selected services sector including companies uh, adopting uh, Industrial Revolution 4 and digitalization technology, which have a significant multiplier effect. So companies who's interested to uh, apply, they can submit uh, their application to MAIDA from uh, 7 November 2020 until 31st uh, December 2022. So these uh, tax, uh, uh, special tax incentive under Penjana, uh, you can also apply together with uh, the uh, special income tax rate at 15% uh, uh, for the uh, expatriate pools that uh, hold for non-resident individual holding key position or C-suite for strategic investment made by companies uh, when they relocate uh, their operation to Malaysia. So submission for C-suite uh, must be received by MAIDA from 7 November 2020 until 31st December 2021. However, uh, under the recent budget 2022, uh, the uh, uh, submission for special income tax uh, uh, rate application has been extended to 31st December 2022 so that it is in line with the special tax incentive under Penjana for services sector. So uh, that is on the uh, special tax incentives. So under the uh, budget 2022, uh, as uh, Mr. Raymond uh, pointed out just now, Digital Ecosystem Acceleration Scheme, or in short, DSEC, was uh, announced. And it is to uh, provide, uh, you know, incentive for digital technology provider uh, to cater for manufacturing and manufacturing related companies as well as a digital infrastructure uh, provider. So uh, this uh, application um, can be submitted uh, to MAIDA also from 30th October 2021 until 31st uh, December 2025. So this DSEC uh, incentive is to strengthen the overall uh, digital ecosystem through the attraction 
of technology as well as uh, digital investment into Malaysia. So this is part and parcel of what uh, you know, government of Malaysia um, uh, is uh, using to uh, attract uh, you know digital investment into the country. Okay, thank you, Dylan. Thank you, thank you, Madam. Okay, I just want to maybe wrap up very quickly here. Yeah. I think we, we first talk about uh, you know what will be a good city characteristic. We talk about the vibrancy of the city, we talk about the friendliness of the people. And, and, and I think it was also mentioned by uh, Mr. Raymond as well. You know, Malaysia, we are multilingual. We, we, we know many languages, you know. I, I together with Dynex, I have known more than five languages, you know. I, and, and and also Malaysia, 